My name is Aquila Jordan. I am the director for the home and community-based programs for the Kansas Department for Aging and Disability Services. For those of you who don't know, my most common name is Q. Please don't tell my mother. She does not appreciate it. That is not what she named me. I will, for those of you who did not get the introduction the first time through, I will usually not use a microphone. I don't need one. I spent 23 years on stage, both as an actress and as a dancer, most of my time dancing. So I can project. However, some people would prefer I use the microphone. I will not do my karaoke routine for you, though I do own a karaoke machine that I got for Boss's Day, and I do utilize in my living room by myself, mostly by myself, because I don't think anybody wants to hear me sing. Um, to give you a little background on me, for those of you who don't know, most of you know I have multiple family members with IDD. What you may or may not know is I am a Texas Tech law grad, guns up. For those of you who don't know anything about the Red Raiders, you should know something about the Red Raiders. Uh, as a result, I spent most of my time on the estate planning and community property law journal, and I specialize in special needs planning, trusts, and um, special needs development with a couple of papers written on um, older, to older parents raising young children with disabilities. My mother-in-law is 51, my father-in-law is 63, and they have a 10 year old who has Down syndrome and um, is nonverbal, and so that was kind of my um, inspiration for the articles I've written on that. So it's an area that is dear and dear to my heart, uh, but disabilities in general, that's kind of how I grew up and where I grew up. For the fun parts about my life, I spent some time in LA, I was a screenwriter for a bit, lived a lot of time in marketing and sales, and I am a certified Texas guardian, and I still hold a couple of cases in uh, Texas, but I've been in Kansas for a while, and I'm probably gonna take the Kansas bar because people keep telling me I should. Anyone who's ever taken that test, don't do it. Crazy people. All right, let's go ahead. I was trying to let some other people join us. Come on in. I haven't even truly started yet, making sure everybody could uh, get in. This is going to be uh, one of our interactive sessions that we talked about earlier. I obviously have 50 more slides than I probably need. That's okay, they will be posted online so that you'll be able to go and review them. I wanted to make them detailed enough so that whatever we aren't able to cover here, we are able to cover, um, you are able to see it online. For those along the wall, I have five or six or 10 seats all the way over here if you guys wanna go ahead. Uh, before we get started and find a seat, we've got lots of room. It's just that all the people who sat in the back should have sat in front. It's like church, guys. Everybody has to sit up front, get close and comfortable. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to uh, try to move through my slides relatively quickly. I do speak fast, so if I need to slow down, anybody in the back of the room want to say, hey, just slow down. I can do that. But I wanted to leave time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers, walk through some uh, creative scenarios. Okay. So, why are we talking about conflict of interest? Why is this a topic of interest that you're all here for? March 17th of 2014, CMS issued uh, updated regulations to 42 CFR 441-301. They added sections C and D, which are brand new. One related to the HCBS transition plan for HCBS settings. So those settings have to meet certain regulation requirements and we'll talk about that in our creative planning sessions this afternoon. It also had a change to person-centered planning and put regulation requirements for person-centered planning for all of the waivers. It's something we've done on IDD for years, but is now being applied to all of the waivers. And it's not just the process, but it's the requirement for a plan. And the question I was asked earlier today was, will the plan need to be standardized across all the waivers across the state? And the answer is yes. So one of the questions CMS asked us, how do you ensure that the same individuals are being reviewed and assessed the same way regardless of where they live? And one of the expectations they have is that we will um, look at our system as a whole and develop and standardize plans and systems um, so that an individual who moves from Hayes will have the exact same spirit, uh, experience if they move to Kansas City or if they lived in Payola. Uh, additionally, the, we've talked about, so if anyone was in my session, you'll notice that they all have the same running theme. This kind of regulation back here behind me, it's been a running theme for a year. 
As the Secretary mentioned today, CMS hasn't really given us as much guidance as we want. We've been waiting for some guidance and then we've decided, you know, let's take some steps to be proactive and look at what needs to be done based on what we read in the reg, what that could look like in our system, so that we have a design for our system before CMS tells us what our system should look like. Let's look at the regulations, let's look at our whole system and identify where we can make improvements and come into compliance if we're not already. The uh, conversations related to this section on conflict-free, there's three pieces we're gonna talk about today. Guardianship and the new policy for um, mitigating the conflict of interest for guardianship and, and the policy that will be posted tomorrow. And handouts, can you grab the handouts from the other room? I have handouts for this room and I, this room holds 250, I may not have enough. Some people are gonna have to share. I hope you're married and love each other because you're gonna have to play nice. We're also gonna talk very briefly, very briefly about targeted case management, mostly because I have a whole presentation from October um, related to the conflict of interest with um, case management, mostly which has been mitigated in the state of Kansas because we are following the CMS um, guidelines. The big piece is the um, separation of services and duties that's in the new regulation that will impact the independent assessment piece. And then we'll just, uh, we probably will not get to the best practices. I put them on there. It's what other states are doing. It will be available for you to read, but I think we'd all rather talk about us. I mean, I like talking about Texas. I'm not even from there, but I like talking about Texas. All right, my clicker walked away. Can you please click, thank you. I appreciate it. I just realized after I did that, I told him to leave. <laughs> All right, so we talked through the citation, we talked about the basic changes, what this applies to. The rule applies to 1915 C's, 1915 I's, and 1915 K's. That's what's in the regulation, that is who they say it applies to. However, we got notification from CMS in the Medicaid director's uh, letter that says, at the discretion of the Health and Human Services uh, Secretary's discretion, we wanted to apply to 1115's too. So any state that has a waiver service that's providing home and community-based um, or home and community-based like services, they need to meet the regulation requirements in the new regulation related to um, conflict-free, person-centered planning and settings so that it's consistent across all waiver types. Um, they have made that decision. If you want to go ahead and start that um, document and pass it around, we can go ahead and do that. Yes. Now don't read before we get there. No, you hand out a piece of paper and everyone goes, and they start reading really fast. I will get to it, I will walk through it. If you can just wait, there's a lot of people who wanna get these passed out. All right, next slide, please. Why were the changes made? CMS had some main goals they were looking at, which is, are we ensuring that individuals are having true access to the community, to be integrated in the community, opportunities for work, now, key note that CMS wants people to know is when we say opportunities for work and opportunities for in integrated employment, it does not necessarily mean that everybody has to work. It means that where the opportunity is available, do they have an, an alternative opportunity like volunteering, things that they wanted to do, and making sure that the individuals have competitive, integrated um, opportunities as an individual who is not disabled would have opportunities. Also wanted to ensure that they're enhancing the quality of HCBS services thus the HCBS final setting rule and wanting to make the changes to that. Looking not at these settings by size or type, but looking at them by quality of life and the experience of the individuals who are there. And then to establish outcome-oriented definitions for not only the provider types, but as well as for the services and um, systems as a whole. So that way we are looking at it from a perspective of how are we meeting the individual's needs? How are we focusing on the person first not the disability first. Next slide, please. What does the new rule say? Basically it says integrate opportunity, access, supports in a place that the individual um, is in a home and community-like setting. So as much as possible, where possible, the person is in charge, the person is um, included, and they're having the same opportunities as an individual who's not disabled or who's not on Medicaid. CMS makes that distinction twice in the rule, that they have the same opportunities as someone who is not on Medicaid, and they also have the same opportunities as someone who is not disabled. 
They wanted to ensure that we weren't um, designing systems that were only focused on, well, you're Medicaid eligible, here's your Medicaid services, the only thing about you get is Medicaid, Medicaid, <laughs> Medicaid, but how are we supporting them as much as possible to be a part of their greater community? The highlights of the final rule, again, if you've seen my previous um, presentations, same slides, repeating, because it's all one presentation, I just couldn't get them to give me three hours and convince everybody to sit through me talking through three hours at one time. But establishing the independent um, assessment and provider qualifications that mitigate conflict of interest, which is the portion we're talking about today. So there's one rule, three issues. Provider qualifications and qual uh, conflict of interest, person-centered planning, which we talked about in the first session, and the HCBS setting rules, which we'll talk about in three individual creative planning sessions, uh, that will kind of generally be about the system as a whole. The transition plan being one piece, CMS has expectations about what is more or less likely institutional <coughs> setting or has the effect of isolating. And so what does that look like and how overall is the system, what does, does this regulation, what kind of impact does it have on us? The design elements are pretty much, um, we're pretty clear that CMS has identified in their um, presentations they've had over the last year, separation of duties, ensuring that the right hand and the left hand are not influencing each other that there are clear roles and definitions on every level of service delivery, assessment, um, development of a person-centered plan, that there's an, a robust monitoring and oversight, which is a little bit of last session, where we've made some changes to our quality assurance and oversight process and protocols so that we can have a better oversight under managed care as well as with our HCBS programs. Consumer complaint system, uh, one of the things that CMS has really been looking at states for is what is your consumer complaint system? How robust is it? In Kansas, we utilize the K Care Ombudsman as a, uh, a, an avenue for individuals who have concerns about the managed care um, organization, about service providers, um, questions that they want to have answered, and then there's uh, dispute resolution processes in place with our assessing entities like CDDOs and ADRCs. Uh, where individuals who have concerns are able to escalate that uh, through the system. <coughs> and then administrative firewalls. This question has come out because I've presented on conflict of interest before. And the question is, well, why can't we just use the administrative firewalls that are in the regulation? The regulation specifically limits it to the only willing and able provider to provide that service. It has to be in a rural area. That's, there's no other provider within 50 miles. And the state has a lot of pieces you'll see that they have to demonstrate that they have done, one of which it allows the individual to dispute the state's claim that's the only willing and able provider in that area. And if that person says, but I don't want this person, and there's an ability to identify another provider, then they've overcome the state's argument that that's the only provider. And so we have to give that opportunity. We'll talk about that. This is my cousin, Kathy. She just moved to Vermont. She is a California girl, born and bred, South Central LA. She grew up in Watts. She now lives in Vermont. And they moved in October. Let's just say, if you don't like the snow, every time I see pictures, I'm like, I am sorry. This is a beach baby is a beach baby. She grew up in the water. Um, she's been swimming since she was nine months old, swims regularly, has a really hard time going to the pool in the dead of winter in Vermont with wet hair, you're going to leave. Pretty much you stay there until everything is dry because you're going to be nice. All right, so the general rule for the HCBS providers and provider qualification is that a provider of home and community-based services for an individual or those who have an interest in being the paid provider or they're employed by a provider um, must not also provide case management or develop the person-centered service plan. The question is, why? Why can't the case manager also provide services? Well, there's already a regulation that says a case manager cannot provide a direct service. Problem number one. The second is the definition of case management. One of the, the four elements that a case manager can do is monitor services. And CMS's uh, contention is it's hard to monitor services if you're the same entity because your job may be to tell your boss that I think so-and-so is not doing their job and I don't think so and so's getting the services, and I don't think you're billing appropriately, and I don't think 
that's hard. And we all say, if you've ever been in a job where your boss supervises you and the person you can't stand, you know, it's hard to be like, I just want to tell on you, but my boss won't let me. And so there's the, the uh, where CMS comes from is not that it happens, not that people are bad, but that it is a conflict of interest occurs when? What, what constitutes a conflict of interest? Do you have to do something bad to constitute a conflict of interest? Yeah, it has the appearance of, and you have the ability to. Those are the two pieces that kind of you know, make up conflict of interest. So that we'll get to the discussion about guardianship because the question was, well, how are you going to say that parents can't be guardians and it's a conflict of interest? It's not the guardianship, it's the roles. And that's what CMS is concerned about. The exception to the rule we talked about just a second ago is the geographic uh, limitations. That's generally um, in the rule, it's the only place where CMS says you do not have to follow this rule, but the state has to meet substantial compliance. And I'll show you the slide where CMS January of 2015 gave us uh, additional guidance in their technical guidance. We've been asking for technical guidance. The last one was 2008. Guess what? The only people who can access it are the people who have access to the system to submit the waiver. So when we tell people, oh yeah, it's updated in the new guidance, nobody else can see it but me. Does it really help you any? Or, uh, we're waiting for CMS to update it on the, their website. You'll see right now, if you go on their website, it's the technical guidance from 2008. They should be updating it with the 2015 that includes the new regulations. And what it includes in that guide is what CMS is doing to review. So there's what we read in the regulation, what we think we understood from talking to CMS uh, leadership, and then the analyst, the person who actually does it. Guess what they pull out? Technical guide. Technical guide says, did the state do X, yes or no? And they follow that guideline. So when the secretary brought up earlier today that, hey, we don't have additional guidance. We've been asking for it. Why are we talking about this? And we don't have any new information to share. I'm sharing you the little extra information we've gotten so far. And we want to open it up to discussions about, all right, if this rule says what it means to say. And I always use the caveat. I thought I knew how to read regulations. I've written regulations. I should know how to read them. But then I read the Department of Labor rule. I was pretty sure I knew what it said. And then the administrative interpretation came out. And I was like, oh, and means or and why? I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. So I don't want to pretend that I'm giving you the regulation exactly the way it's written. If exactly the way it's written is what it means, then that's what we need to look at. However, they can interpret it to mean lots of things. And so that's why we're waiting for some additional guidance from CMS to say, you've seen our system. We've submitted to you everything that we're doing in CanCare. You approved our special terms and conditions. Does that mean we've mitigated conflict, conflict of interest? And if not, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? The definition, according to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, home and community-based services must be conflict-free and has the following uh, characteristics. A separation of duties, because they want a freedom from coercion, that the same entity can't um, have the ability to self-refer. Um, the separation of case management from the provision of direct services and the separation of eligibility determination from the direct service provision. Same idea as they want eligibility to be entirely independent, not influenced by provider uh, services, not being influenced by uh, whether or not it's going to impact the same entity that's doing the um, assessment process, but the assessment is independent of all, all of those influences. Case management is in, uh, independent of those with the idea that direct service providers are providing services. And for those who were in my earlier session, I told you I'd talk to you about, and the other caveat they have about who gets to develop the person-centered plan. Independent and free from conflict of interest. What they're looking at is, is there a method to coerce? Not did you coerce, is there a method? Is there incentive? Could you steer individuals, theoretically or actually, um, towards or away from certain choices of providers, such as self-referral, referral to a parent or sister company uh, for services? And is anyone conducting evaluations, assessments, or the plan of care, that person can also cannot be related by blood, marriage, or work for the provider, um, or be a paid caregiver? So we get to that paid caregiver piece, and that takes us to the guardianship question. So the question that came up was, why can't a guardian be paid to provide support? 
that's not, I can't answer that question because that's not the question to ask. The question is, when can a guardian not be paid to provide supports? And when do they have to make a choice between being a service provider and serving as the guardian? And the situation is this, a guardian or a durable power of attorney, anyone who has the authority to make health care decisions, to make financial decisions, they control the person's life and can make life and death decisions for that individual. If that individual wants to or is currently being paid to provide supports, they have to make a choice. In Kansas, we have a statute that allows the guardian to go to the court and they're not, go, they're not allowed to, required, keyword here, Guardians, regardless of whether or not you're, you are um, going to continue to be paid to provide supports or not, if you have receiving any funds and are benefiting financially from the ward, you're required by state law to notify the court in a special or annual report that you are a paid caregiver for the ward. Depending on the judge, they may say, I want to know how much. Because if you get, you know, $10,000 a year versus $100,000 a year, it may influence whether or not the judge thinks there's a conflict of interest. Um, some courts, they don't have a problem with it, um, and they say yes. The key is the court has to actually say there is no conflict of interest. Well, that's, anybody who's tried to do that, that's hard. And who wants to spend a couple thousand dollars hiring an attorney just to get the judge to sign a piece of paper that says, I agree, there's not a conflict of interest. Or if there is one, here's what I want you to do and here's what it looks like. Go ahead and we're gonna slip Skip a couple of slides. Um, so keep going. This, we've just talked about the problem already. So the areas of conflict we've talked about, a guardian or a durable power of attorney, any individual, if you're the rep payee, think of it this, I'm the rep payee, I get your money, and then I help develop your plan of care, and then I, I, I self-direct that care for you as your guardian, and I hire myself to be the worker, and I work all the hours in the plan of care that I helped develop, that I helped determine how many hours, and I, I also selected how much I got paid. That's the conflict of interest that arises. So in those cases, you, one, you notify the court. If the court doesn't respond, or you don't get notification with yes or no, then the solution is, move to the next slide, is a designated representative. Go ahead and keep skipping through. The designated representative is new. That is something that we have not done in Kansas. This is the policy that you'll see posted and that you have in your hand. So we're gonna walk through that really quickly because I wanna give you guys some time to discuss it. So here's what this is. Essentially, an individual can choose, if they want to, to have a designated representative. I don't wanna hire and fire people. I mean, I like hiring people, but I don't wanna fire anybody. So I'm gonna hire my sister. You're responsible for the bad employees. You sign the time sheets. You take care of the paperwork and all of that stuff. But I still say when they come in and how many hours they work and the schedule they do and what they do for me, but I don't want all of those boss boss stuff. I wanna be the boss, but I don't wanna always be the boss. So a person can self-select a designated representative. The problem was if I select Kimberly today and I select Jerry tomorrow, how do you know? Jerry comes and says, hey, but she said she wants me to manage and I just fired Kimberly. Yeah, so we create a form, that's the last two pages, that says, I select Kimberly Claire to be my de designated representative to direct my workers on my behalf and to be responsible for those roles and responsibilities. So I can, as a consumer, say I wanna hire, or I wanna not hire, it's not a paid compensated position, but I wanna select Kimberly Claire to, to serve as that responsible person for me who will take care of those roles because I may not be able to make all of those decisions. You may have someone who has limited capacity, but they're not incapacitated. They don't need a ward, but they need some support. So then you have a designated representative. The designated representative is the safeguard. So the designated representative cannot be a paid care provider. You cannot select another direct service worker because that defeated the purpose of the designated representative. This is an individual who will step in and make the decisions so that way the guardian or the other workers are not you know, managing that time and hope their goal is for them to be that person who's in the middle who, who mitigates the conflict of interest. So when is a designated representative required? It's required when a guardian or durable power of attorney, an individual who is in the position of making decisions and can influence, can be the only person 
hiring, firing, managing, training, selecting themselves, selecting how many hours in the plan of care, developing the person center support plan, also collecting the social security and paying or not paying their bills and they're the only person in the mix, a designated representative is necessary or they can decide not to be a guardian. Right, there's two options. They can say, I'm gonna hire somebody. I don't wanna be paid anymore. I'm gonna hire someone else to do it. I wanna continue to be paid, so I'm gonna have someone else be the guardian. Or the simplest solution is the designated representative. Complete the form that says, for the next year, I have selected Susie to be the designated representative. The only thing that representative can do is related to HCBS. They don't supersede the guardian. They can't go to the bank and be like, hey, can you just give me, I just need this piece of paper right here. Can you sign away that bank account to me? They can't step in for the guardian in any other role than developing the person center support plan, signing off on the integrated service plan, um, hiring, firing, managing, working with the FMS provider to uh, verify time and attendance for workers, including the court appointed guardian or the, the DPOA. And I want to clarify it's an activated DPOA. Someone who actively is currently able to serve in the role of a durable power of attorney, not someone who has paper that says, and then one day if I'm in the hospital and I'm unable to make a decision, all right, you're in charge of making those decisions. That's not activated. It's someone who currently has that authority now, and they have the ability to go sell their property and put them in a nursing home, you know, anybody who's that kind of authority. So we're gonna, Kevin told me he's gonna stop me here. I've got a couple other slides we'll get to, but let's open it up here so that I am more responsive than I was this morning. So we're interested in questions, yes. It seems like knowing guardianship is- There's a video recording, so okay, go. Determining um, if guardianship is in place might be a little easier. Like how would we know if activated DPOA is happening? Is it something that providers need to be asking? Or CEOs let us know, your coordinators, etc. So for the DPOA question, if there's a guardianship, there's a, there's a small, for me, there's a small loophole. I used to be a guardianship court investigator. Small loophole in Kansas law. You're not required to get new letters every year. So uh, you may have letters that are 20 years old and they are valid, or you may have letters that are 20 years old and you haven't been a guardian in 19 years. And there's no way to know the difference. So Texas has a requirement that every year the judge has to give you new letters. Your letters are more than 365 days old, the bank cuts you off. They're gonna say, I don't have any new letters, say that you're the guardian. You're not able to do anything. So that one is going to still require, usually what I ask for is, can I see your most recent annual report? So that I know that you're still the guardian, your name is still on it, you're still responding. For an activated durable power of attorney, it's the document itself. <coughs> Read the document. Does it say, in the future, you'll be the durable power of attorney? Or does it say, effective three weeks ago, you're responsible? The hard part is, a durable power of attorney can be just torn up. Right, you tore it up. The idea would be, hopefully I tore up the only copy, and I didn't make copies and say, here's your copy and my copy, the attorney's copy. So that is a little harder. Uh, it's going to be depending on, one, if they get a designated representative with a managed care organization, you need a copy with the FMS provider so they know, hey, this is an okay person to pay. Um, the other thing will be, you've got to look at the document. That's the biggest thing with the durable power. There was a but you were asking him, you were asking about the designated representative, right? No, no, the DPOA. Okay, DPOA. Active, I mean, okay. Yeah, how do good. We, if they don't tell us. All right, very right. good. There was a question back there. The guardian is the legal authority. The guardian. Could you repeat the question? It. Oh, sorry. The question is, if a person does not have a legally authorized, that is weird. If the person does not have a legally uh, uh, appointed guardian, then they may authorize their own designated representative. If they have a legally appointed guardian, and Kansas is not as good as some states as actually doing a lot of limited guardianships, so generally if there's a guardianship, that person has no right to authority to sign any documents, the guardian is the authority. So the guardian selects the designated representative. Mm -hmm. 
then they need to designate a representative. That's the quickest, easiest way to do it. The guardian says, I'm going to pick daughter to be the designated representative. By signing that though, now the daughter is the only one who can sign as the authorized signature on the integrated service plan. They're the person who needs to attend the, the, and decide on what services are needed, participate in the assessments. Mom can still participate, family can still participate. They're still a part of the team and the process, but the individual responsible for directing that care now is the designated representative. They cannot supersede the guardian in their role in any other field. This is where the guardian says, I am voluntarily giving up my authority at this point for this purpose. And it's a kind of a limited authority for that. Not okay. a perfect solution. There was a question here, and then I'm gonna come tell us go back around across the room. That was your question? Okay. Okay. Great, right here. So the form is going to be, it's expected to be managed with the managed care organization, but it's, gonna, it, it's multiple people I need to be aware of it, and it may be the first time we find out that mom is the paid provider, the FMS provider, right? The care coordinator may not know that at the time. It may not have been the intention. It may have been to hire the sister, and then the sister goes away to college. She's no longer the worker, and so they've gone back to the FMS provider and said, okay, well, I'll be the paid provider. So then the FMS provider can execute that document with them, and then they would just need to get a copy to the MCO. So it is going to be, you know, targeted case manager, whoever finds out about that situation, making sure that everyone has a copy of it, and if there isn't one on file, and you can't find it, FMS provider is the one who ultimately has to hold it, right? Because ultimately, they're gonna be paying this person, if they don't have that document, they're gonna say, I'm sorry, you're the guardian, and you don't have an authorization saying that you're appointing somebody else, so if the care coordinator does it, or the TCM is part of saying, oh, up from, uh, first day, I know I want mom to be the paid provider, and she's the guardian, that FMS provider needs it, because they're going to deny that person being able to clock in and out and, and be that provider without that document. And we don't want to execute more than one. All right, next question. That is not the Repeat the question. So the question is, if the parent is providing support, but the parent is not the guardian, the individual is their own guardian, or they have a different guardian, that's not an issue. Right, right Because the individual has the right to choose who they want. So the question is, when will that be challenged? You've got someone who may be um, aging, and or they may have IDD, they may have limited capacity or diminishing capacity, at what point is that challenged? There's two ways. One is if the APS report is needed because the individual is demonstrating an inability to care for themselves, to direct their own care, to make those decisions, APS can then do a referral for guardianship. Um, or a report to the, the doctor, the doctor um, identifies this is an individual that no longer has that capacity because the only two people who can make a decision is the doctor saying the person doesn't have the ability to make decisions and the court making, until the court does, we have to presume that person has decision making capability and we can't otherwise make a decision. Sure, of course. No. Question. Not a repeat. repeat. Sorry, the question is, is there ever a reason for a guardian to also seek out DPOA? No. Right here. What if mom is the payee, the guardian, and has hired an administrator that hires all the So essentially, mom is a guardian and the payee, and she's hired an administrator. She's essentially designated a representative. This would just be completing the form to say, yep, you're the person for HCBS services as well. Okay, next question here. Timelines for, okay, so timelines. So the policy will be posted tomorrow, fingers crossed. The policy, once it's posted, will be up for 30 days. You can send comments to hcbs-ks at kdads.ks, wait, yes, .gov. And the comment line put conflict of interest policy, comments. Something that will be consistent, but I know that's what you're asking about. It's gonna be on the policy, um, tells you exactly what to put in the subject lines. We'll take that for 30 days, then we'll review it, see if there needs to be any changes to the policy, if we need to have a conference call to talk about what the possible changes are, and then we'll post for final, uh, the final document. 
and that will be when it's effective. However, some have started using the actual form now because the form itself is just a designation. And we're coming across right, here. Right, right, yeah, and I'll come back. So this document is only being drafted just for HCBS services. But a similar document can be drafted um, if that individual wants to draft a document saying, I authorize so and so to be responsible for my, my money. That's, that's starting to be too close to giving legal advice. It's kind of, that's walking the line there. But this form itself would not be the appropriate form to use because it's designed just for HCBS, just for that purpose. That, so the question is, could a similar document be used for individuals with lower or diminishing capacities? I've got two comments. One, that's one, one step too close to offering legal advice because the document would be a binding document between individuals and we might be getting too close to other relationships. Generally, it's a durable power of attorney that you would, you, and you would basically say only for rent only for finances. I mean, durable power of attorney can be as limited or as broad as you want to. That's generally the, the vehicle that's used for this that. This question right here. How would an provider know besides the ISP? Because we don't have copies of that, we get authorization. So that's not your responsible to ability question to monitor? Again. So the question, so the, the question is, how does the FMS provider know who knows who signs the ISP? That's a quality assurance and monitoring on our side, and it's an MCO responsibility to make sure they have a copy of both the designated representative and the integrated service plan. It can be this quick. It can be mom is signed the integrated service plan. She goes to the FMS provider. Okay, I'm going to be paid to provide supports. Well, you're the guardian. Yes, we can't do that. You need to do a designated representative. You now have mom at the time rightfully signed the ISP. She's now gone to start setting up services to get paid. She needs to set up a designated representative. Those documents aren't going to match, but the process wasn't inappropriate. So we will manage it on the state side, whether or not there's a the right documents were signed. We need to mitigate a, a problem that has occurred there. What we would ask is the FMS provider maintain the document, and then if they have someone who comes to them and says, "Okay, well, I guess I can't be the guardian of the paid provider, so I, I'm going to designate someone." That it's something that can be executed with the FMS provider, and a copy would be sent to the um, MCO. All right. Because ultimately, and the key here is ultimately the FMS provider is the holder of that document because you've got to pay it. And if you don't have it, you're going to assume we got to start from scratch, and we want to minimize right that. Here, here, here. Do you It's a good question, and that's a really great idea. I did not anticipate that. The question was, what about agency directed? So generally the answer would be no, because this the idea here is someone is self-directing, and the conflict is I am self-directing and hiring myself and paying myself and saying I work the hours I worked. Agency directed, I need to walk that through. Let me think that through because I don't have a, an answer. My first inkling is, oh yeah, it's a good idea. And then my second thought is, maybe that's not such a good idea. So let me think about it. Yeah, let me think about that. All right. Good. So if it's not disclosed, this is the policy that will go out. It will be part of the policy and the rights and responsibilities for that individual. That guardian has signed that rights and responsibilities that I will tell and I will do all that stuff, that may become a referral to Medicaid fraud because they knowingly decided not to tell you that they're the guardian. Right so right. that would not be something held against you, but if you became aware of it and ignored it, that would be the problem there. Question right over here. Okay, two parent guardianship situation. So this is how we've done it so far with two parent guardians. One says I want to be paid, the other does not. No, they can use that document to designate 
dad is going to be the director? You can. That's a, what we've had some who are going to send it to them as part of their annual report. I have a conflict of interest for one of the guardians. However, we've mitigated by the other one isn't getting paid. So there's evidence that we don't have a conflict of interest. So some are using it that way just as an evidence of no conflict. Another one back here. So the question is, if the designated representative doesn't live here, is there any restriction? The restriction is that they are an active participant in the person-centered planning process. So could they live out of state? Yes. Um, but they have to be the person responsible for the staff, hiring, firing, managing, verifying time and attendance. So that's probably not the best individual to be selected because you're supposed to be helping mitigate the conflict of the person in the home is the only person who knows what's going on. So I think there's time for a couple more here. Yes. So the question is from an FMS provider, I have already had an employment agreement, a service agreement, and at this point, I don't, you know, I, do I need to get them all signed again? I, generally, the answer would be no, because this is a form that's being utilized, and it would be part of the rights and responsibilities as being on the program, but you may add it to your agreements in the future, so it's very clear, and if you do not tell me that you're the guardian and I find out, I am reporting you, and if you, you know, the situation changes, you have so many days to come back and let us know, but I would generally say you probably don't have to do whole new agreements. Okay, we had one in the back of the room. The question is, can the court at the time of an annual report, when they submitted documentation or whatever the requirement is with their annual report, that there's a conflict, can the judge at that time say there's no conflict? Yes. Um, the key is, did the judge say anything back? The filing alone does not demonstrate a mitigation of conflict of interest. It's just compliance with the state law that says, I filed like I'm supposed to. What some have had to do is go to an attorney to get an order drafted so that when they submit their annual report, there's an actual order they get back that says, yes, your, your annual report was approved and there is no conflict of interest. That's an extra step, which is why we wanted to make sure we had this is available, that if you don't hear back, you don't have to wait for the judge and be up in the air, you can make a decision. Um, and so we utilize the Oregon model. Please review the policy, look at it, read it over. You know, I, I did do some copy and paste because it was easier. And we are, CMS has already approved this model. And so look at it, see if it makes sense. One more question. We'll take one more question and then I will tell you where you can see my the PowerPoint there. Please also apply for a guardian who holds limited license and may not be a paid staff, but is managing or receiving the medical time. So the question is for a guardian who also has a limited license, they have to file, follow the licensure requirement. And they are required to first get the documentation from the, the judge. And as a, and the staff is not in the room, but I believe it says in that case, no, because of any provider, residential provider cannot be the guardian of the individuals they serve. That is not something that is um, acceptable in the CMS model. So. Once again, your comments are welcome, and I believe you usually stay up here to be available to visit with people.